one. We're live on the air. Everybody, welcome. I am Stefan Adika. You're an artist on record. Your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. And guess who's in the hot seat tonight? I have a legend, Bob Daisley. He's in the house. That's right. He's going to talk with us, chat with us. You could put some questions in there. Maybe we'll get to it. Maybe we won't. But you know what? We're going to have a good time. Bob has played with many, many, many. He's a legend himself. And you know what? It's all about to happen right about now. And you know what to do. Give us a thumbs up. Hit the bell to be notified when we come on. Subscribe and get ready to rock and roll because it's all happening now, kids, on Artist on Record, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist now. <music> Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Right now, he's here in the house. Give him a big round of applause. Mr. Bob Daisley is in the house right now. Welcome, Bob. The crowd is going insane for you. I hope you can hear that, huh? Sounds nice, huh? Hey, Stephen, how are you going? I'm doing great. Love, you know what? It's great to have you here. Last time you were here, we had a great conversation. It was you, me, and Eric Singer. And That's then right. it went so well. I figured that you and I need to chat together without him interrupting he's eating he's so not i love eric he's a great guy and, <laughs> and and it was good to have him on there because he and i can relate you know to so much we've done a lot of stuff together over the years a, a <clears throat> lot of stuff a, you know oh, yeah yeah I, I mean your your just track record as being an incredible bass player widow make a rainbow gary moore you're right he Ozzy, you've done a lot of great stuff. The, the, a few to mention, and you have a new project, the upstarts that you have, and we'll try to play some tracks, but if everybody's watching, links are in the description down below. I actually have the links for each video of Bob's new project, and you can check it out. I would consider the new music that you're doing. It it's, has that, that surf 60s feeling instrumental. Would you, yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it's got a touch of the... Um... I suppose the the Pink Floyd kind of spaciness to some of it, which I love, and and it wasn't really like planned out; it just sort of happened. Uh, Rob Grosser, the drummer that I was um, working with at his studio, we we put the, together the um, the tribute to Gary Moore, you know, Moore Blues for Gary. Um, and at the end of it, Rob started playing me a couple of tracks that he put roughs down of 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 just his, you know, he had, he had just a click track with with some guitar parts and and um, and and I really liked it and, and and he said oh will you play on a couple of tracks for me so I did and then we started putting stuff together together if you know what I mean we started writing new stuff and he had other ideas in the can and and we were um, you know just I really enjoyed it it was fun and I think the enjoyment if you're having fun and you're really enjoying what you do it comes out in the music. It, and, uh, it really does. It's it's yeah. really, you know, I was listening to it too and, you know, organizing my, my house and I'm, it had that 60s. It brought me back to to definitely the 60s, just the sound, you know. It had mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. a little wet, some of it had that Western beach, a little bit of each, everything I grew up with on it. And, uh, right, right. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's not meant to sound slick and clever and modern and and all the rest of it it's it's just got its own vibe in it and its own soul sort of thing uh which is what i love about it you know i remember i remember what after we'd done a few tracks and i took maybe i don't know six or eight tracks on a disc and i just went and sat by the sea here and put it on and just listened to it and just sort of stared out into the sea and i thought wow this is really good you know i, I really liked it i was enjoying it you know so yeah, yeah, and it was it was it was, a, it was it was a different sound that what you people are not used to hearing you play. It was a it yeah, was it's a, not aggressive, it's not heavy, it's not dark, it's it's um it's 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 got a nice mood to it. It you, you know what, Bob? Do you mind if I try to play? They, they'll do a copyright. No, on no, it. go can, ahead. Can I play no, for I, the audience? The yeah, um, that I send you, they're the ones that have got little film clips. There's a whole album's worth. We'll do, you know, we'll do, I have uh, four songs, but I could play some of the, the, the sound in here. It's plugged in there. We won't pull up the clip sure. right now, but check this out. Sure, let's see sure, if we can pull sure. this up for the kids right here. Okay. And, and uh, let's pull this up. See if this comes up here. 
it has that 60s sound. It's got you a, know? Yeah, a, vague, a vague sort of Indian, Eastern. I hear, thing yeah. With the, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, it, has, it definitely has the Eastern sound yeah, on yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's the upstarts. I'm going to put all links to all the videos so you guys can watch it. We have about four links to the songs in the description. So go check that out. So right now we got Bob Daisley in the house. We're talking about his band, the upstarts. Thanks for everybody being in, in the chat with, with us. And we'll get to your questions in there. And um, we're going to talk to Bob. Bob also has a great book out for facts sake. And uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's where did you get that title from for facts sake? i woke up one morning with it i, I was originally going to call it you couldn't make this stuff up but then i woke up one morning and i thought for fuck's sake because in all western english-speaking countries for fuck's sake is a really common saying and i wanted it to be factual so i thought for fuck's sake you know that that's a that's a better title and and people liked it you know so i went with that but um, it, it's because it's a little tongue in cheek as well. So, you know, it's got some humor about it, but, but it also makes that statement. This, these are the facts. It, it, these are the facts, but you know what? You did it politely. You did it in a nice oh, way. Oh, sure. You yeah, didn't go did so that. Brooklyn. You didn't go Brooklyn. No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You I did didn't want to, you know, do any name calling or, or, or slanderous statements. I just told the story of what happened and how it happened, and and people can make their own mind up, sort of thing. Yeah, and and I put the links will be in our description. You guys could check out the book. There's great photographs. I mean, yeah, you got so many stories with so many just, the, you know, the who's who of rock and roll. We get from Richie Blackmore, Randy Rhodes, Gary Moore, Tony Iommi, Ron, you know, Ronnie James Dio, of course, Ozzy, yeah, yeah. Bon Scott. Yeah, There's yeah. a Bon Scott, John Bonham, and uh, yeah. And George Harrison. Let me ask you about yeah. the George Harrison about you, 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 with that story in there. Well, he was he was a friend of Gary's because Gary lived in um, what was the name of the place just outside of London where George's big um, house was, and and Gary was mates with him. Um, I'll, I'll think of the name. It'll come to me. <clears throat> but but um, George turned up at one of our shows when we played the Hammersmith Odeon. Um, in London and um, you know ever since I'd been about sort of around the age of 13 14 I'd been a major Beatles fan you know it's like wow Beatles you know and to have a Beatle at our show and and George stood on my side of the stage for the whole show and it was only about probably maybe I don't know 15 18 feet away from me and we did the whole show. And then to meet him after the show, it, me it meant a lot to me. You know, I was only in my 30s at that point. But, it, you know, it meant an awful lot to, to shake George Harrison's hand, that hand. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> One of those two hands that did all that stuff. You know, he was um, very, very sort of um, placid guy, nice. You know, it was, and, you know that, that meant a lot to me. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine, huh? And it just yeah, that that hand. That's what I would be thinking. And I'd be yeah. ner too nervous to even speak to the man, you know. Oh no, I talked to him and um, but what he how he made it sound, I you know, I put this story in the book as well, but he made it sound like he used to be in some band and that they used to play there at the Hammersmith Odeon and and I felt like saying, him, hang on. You're George Harrison. The band you're talking about is the Beatles. You know, <laughs> hey. <laughs> you know? But it was, it, was, it was very sort of humble about the whole thing, you know. Wow. But, wow. Uh, yeah, just to meet him and shake his hand, it, it meant, meant a lot to me. That's wild. So he was, he was tight with Gary Moore, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were mates. Wow. He had a lot of respect for Gary because Gary was such a great player. You know? He really was. He really was. And the last time you were here, we were talking, I, I guess, Gary Moore. Is that the Eric Singer connection? How you and, yes. how did you and Eric? That's how you guys Well, met. actually, no, I, I met Gary through, uh, sorry, I met Eric through not playing with Gary, but but doing the Black Sabbath album in 86, The that's Eternal right. Idol. And Eric was the drummer. And then, and then when I went back, because I was only doing that as a sort of, as a kind of session thing, you know, although they asked me to join the band and then I was, I was playing with Gary Moore and I was very happy with Gary Moore. And, you know, I wasn't looking to um, change camps kind of thing, you know. 
but but in that was in 86 and then in 87 uh, Gary was was looking for a drummer so I told him about Eric and and we and we flew um, Eric over and um, I, I thought Eric would be you know just right for the band and he was and he got the gig you know so um... <clears throat> And the rest was all history. Very well, yeah, yeah. You know, Eric had a lot of respect for for Gary, oh. and and the band worked out well. And um, you know, Eric and I did some other stuff together. You know, later on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Eric and I got on very well together musically, friendship wise, and I used to stay at his house in L.A. when I went there. And, you know. Yeah, so, I mean Gary Moore. Huh? Now, what type of person was Gary? Like, I'm sure you get asked asked all the time. But what a great, <laughs> what a great. Well, well player. Gary was, you know, obviously an Irishman, and um, very serious about music and all that. But such a great sense of humor, very witty, very clever, very sharp. You know, and he and I got on like a house on fire because. You know, quite quite often, if there was a load of people in a room, it was we were on our own wavelength kind of thing, and we used to joke about things. Other people didn't get our joke, but but we were, <laughs> we were de <laughs> definitely on the same uh, wavelength. He, he was, um, you know, a, a very uh, astute person, a very astute musician as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the greatest, really. One oh, of the, he was. He oh, sure. really was. Really yeah, yeah. Was. Even with the recognition that he did have, I still think he was underrated. Yeah, yeah. He was. I don't you think know, there was a big enough fuss made when he when he did go, which was why I did that album, More Blues for Gary, with a more spelt, spelt like his name, M O O R E, More Blues for Gary, and and I got some great players and great performances on on that album. Yeah, you definitely did. You definitely did. Yeah. yeah. I was pulling some pictures of the internet. And maybe you could, you know, share the stories over. Here's a, here's a, here's a, another shot right oh, here. Oh, that was that was when I was touring with Gary in Ireland, and that would have been around, I think maybe like eighty four somewhere around there. Wow. And Phil Linnett, yeah, Phil Linnett came came to the shows, and he used to get up and do uh, Prisium Walkways with Gary. Wow, um, as the encore number, you know. So, so he was there, and he was, he was a lovely bloke too, Phil Linnett. You know. It's, oh, well, um, amazing! Very sad when he went as well. Yeah, he was young, huh? When he passed away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I don't know. But... It's just so talented. His voice is is, is just the melody. Oh, he was world. unique. Yeah, I could I could hear a little influence of Van Morrison. In, in his in his vocals and things like that um, yeah but 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 you know the the music and and what he played as a bass player for that music a lot of it was simple and, and that, but it was just right you know it was just right for the music and um, he's uh, you know his stage image the whole thing he was you know certainly one of the greats and, and I really do think thin Lizzy was was an underrated band. Oh, under you know the even the well the popular songs that everybody the, the, they do know, but the boys you can hear down, the boys of yeah. The hits, I, yeah. I, I just heard it on, yes. on the, ra the radio. I go, it's, it's timeless. The song just it just it's great, and you can hear, in his voice he even has, and maybe I'm wrong. He's an Irish cat, but he has that Jersey sound where I could hear where guys like Bruce Springsteen, you know, they all they a little this they pulled from him, you know, probably like, influences of stuff that he'd listened to and. Oh yeah, and that that sort of thing, you know. Yes, um, I, I remember he did a track on a Johnny Thunder's record, and it was with him and Steve Marriott. And uh, oh it was, wow, it was a, yeah, yeah, it was on uh, an album called K Sera Sera. I forget the right. track it was, but it was really cool. It was a cool track, right. and I mean, look what you who you have on it, Steve Marriott, and you have yeah, Phil exactly. on it. What it a was great just, singer he was. Oh, was totally, cool. One yeah. of my favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. sitting in a bar in a hotel in London one night. I think it was Blake's Hotel. Blake's Hotel was in Fulham in London, and and it was a it was a bit of a sort of hangout place. I was waiting for I can't remember who it was. Somebody in a band that I was in at the time. I can't remember what band. Or it could have been Widowmaker. It could have whatever. But I was waiting for somebody, and I was sitting on a bar stool, just a little quiet bar. And I looked to my left, and there's a guy sitting there, and we started chatting. I thought, hang on, that's Steve Marriott. 
and I started it, I started talking to Steve. That's the first time I'd ever met him. But that was another one. I had great respect for for you know him as a performer, as a songwriter, uh, you know, with Ronnie Lane and yeah. All that. It was it was real, real proper East End London, Steve Marriott. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, he 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 was he yeah he was another great. Now in the oh, book, yeah, you, sure. you got stories and there's more. You got Bon Scott, John, John Bon, and we talk about and the notorious Don Arden. You talk you talk about that in the book. So the book yeah. is pretty interesting over here. And uh, for everybody watching right now, I got Bob Daisley. We're talking to if you're just tuning in and thank everybody for your super chats, Debbie Muller, Deb Jackson. Thank you guys very much. Um, we're in here. We're talking. If you have any questions, pop them up. I'll try to get them if I could see it good. I'm too busy talking with Bobby and I don't want to disrupt <laughs> the, disrupt the uh, conversation as well. So thank you for all for bearing with me. But um, Don Arnon, I got to ask you. Yeah. That's a tough cookie, that man. That's a tough oh, cookie. Sure, he had that reputation of, uh, of being the, um, well, his, his, his sort of nickname was, was the, uh, the Al Capone of pop because he was sort of uh, strong-armed heavy guy with and didn't take any nonsense from anyone and the story about him dangling someone out the window i, th I think it was robert stigwood um, was it really I, yeah i think so robert stigwood famous robert. for cyanide fever uh, bgs he was he was doing all those oh yeah, yeah 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 wow yeah yeah and i think he got dangled out of a third story window in london for for um I can't remember the offence. He was trying to nick one of the acts that Don Arden had, or or nick one of his musicians, or something. But um, wow! Hmm. So you don't see that hanging from the window, old school, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he you know what? He had a couple of what? henchmen with him. They, they couple but him. but Don was they, a stand-up guy. Didn't he didn't hang. drop him. He didn't drop him. He let yeah. him. He, he pulled him back up. He yeah. just That's don't right. take my axe. Leave them Don all. Don was sort of like a, a, a lovable rogue. You know, he he had a heart, and he and he he did a lot for the business. And, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a lot of his reputation was was, um, <clears throat> I suppose, not exactly favourable for him. But but he, he's you know I, I still had respect for him, and he, and he was uh, you know even the small face the guys in the small faces that that say that you know he ripped them off and all the rest they they still have a certain amount of affection for him and that you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cr cr incredible. This that's a great. You know what? It's almost like the movie um with Brad Pitt. He reminds me of a, a character from from the movie Snatch or something like. Uh, what's oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It it's something yeah. like that. And if for everybody tuning, this is the book that we're talking about for fact's sake right here. And there's a picture of this Bob with Randy from Randy's personal album right there. But you got all these stories about these legendary people. It's a great autobiography. Definitely check it out. And um. Randy Rhodes, tell me about him for a second now. I mean, well, it, it was it was another very sort of gentle person. He he was um, he had a funny sense of humor, a bit quirky. Um, when when Ozzy and I first hooked up with Randy, Ozzy had seen Randy in L.A. and um, he's he he saw him just do a sort of little demonstration. Of playing and that and he said right you're in you got the gig if you want it blah 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 but then Ozzy came back to England uh, and this was in 1979 and um, and then Ozzy was going to put another band together and I and uh, it was David Arden at Jet Records for me he said I've got your train ticket go up and see Ozzy sees you know see if you're interested blah 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 you know when I got up there um, I said to Ozzy, yeah, I loved Ozzy. We got on like a house on fire. It was, you know, it, it was great. You know, it was, um, we had a great laugh together and, and we could, we just felt that the vibe was right. We were going to, yeah. Hey. <laughs> there it is. Great yeah. picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was taken at Ridge Farm when we were doing that first album. But, um, you know, after we had a little knock together, I, we, he and I went out in the kitchen and we would make a cup of tea. And I said to Ozzy, look, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to work with you. And I, I really, you know, liked the idea of that. And I said, but the other guys, I said, look, you know, they're okay. They're nice guys and they play okay and all that. But I said, I, I don't think they're world class. 
And he said, hang on a minute. <laughs> and he walked in, he had this sort of like rehearsal room built integrally on his on his house, you know. So uh, he walked in and he said, pack up, fellas, you can go home, it's not working out. And that's that's that was it. That was them gone, you know. And it was after that that he said to me, I met this other this this guitar teacher in LA. His name's Randy Rhodes. I said, Well, let's get him over. But when he said guitar teacher, I I sort of envisaged the, this this sort of older guy with you know pipe and slippers and cardigan and you know you know that that, that. but when um, Jet Records flew Randy over, you know David Arden didn't want to do it because he was in charge of the band at that point, and he didn't want to fly Randy over. He said, "Well, no, he's unknown. He's young. He's nobody's heard of him. Blah blah blah." You know. And so, but then David Arden's words were, and I still remember his exact words. He said, "Against my better judgment, I flew him over." And, and that's when Ozzy and I went to Jet Records in London, and Randy was there. And at the first few minutes of meeting Randy, and talking, we 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 thought he was gay <laughs> yeah, <'cause laughs> because he was quite effeminate and and very sort of um, quite refined as well, you know. And we just we thought, is, is he gay? <laughs> Obviously he wasn't. No, he had a he had a girlfriend and he was very heterosexual and and um as as soon as we start we we the three of us caught a train up to Aussies and we stayed over there and we had that first play together in Aussie's um rehearsal room at his house. And wow. as soon as Randy and I started playing together at the end of the first sort of little knock that we had together we we said to each other well great this is good but you know i said like the way you play and he said that to me almost at the same time almost the same words you know so we knew that it was going to happen you know a mutual and, respect right there yeah and there, there is the story in my book where i talk about being on the um the, the railway platform uh, the next morning randy and i went back to uh, london because he had a hotel there and uh, and I lived in London, and he and I were catching a train back to London the next morning. And when we were standing on the railway platform together, I had this this weird sort of premonition. I just thought one day people are going to, you know, repeatedly ask me what was it like to play with Randy Rhodes. And I had this sort of premonition about him. You know, I I you know obviously I didn't know that he wasn't going to be around that long or or what was going to happen with the band and the album and all the rest of it. But um, you know, as as history has shown now, it's uh, uh, you know that that those first two albums just just became milestones in 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 rock history. And uh, yeah, we love working together. You know, when we got Lee, that was the last. Um, piece of the puzzle put together and, and it all just clicked and it all just, you know, went, went so well. One thing I'd like to thank everybody about is, is the, the, the people that have gone to the trouble to leave reviews of my book. They love it. And, you know, they give it five stars and they, they praise it. And that, that's really nice to see. Obviously yeah. they, you know, they must love it. And, and, you know, they've, they've read it and they, and they do approve it, you know, it, but it's it's really nice that they went to the trouble to uh, express that. So thank it, you, everybody who did. Yeah, I mean these are great stories to document, and it's it's rock history. It really is. You know, I was lucky enough to meet Lee in London at the O2 Arena uh, at a Kiss show with Eric Singer. And uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So what that was that? that was uh ooh, it was it was. It was before the pandemic happened, so oh, okay. um, that's so already like four or five years three, ago. It had been four, four or five years ago okay. around then, and yeah. I didn't know it was yeah, Lee. Yeah. He was sitting, oh. you know, we were in the VIP section together, and um, I think he was he was in a wheelchair, and um, yeah, he was already sick by he then. Was, he was already um, sick, yeah. And I was, what happened? His funny story. I was eating there was like a some kind of salad and it was a plastic fork and the fork broke in the salad i almost ate the plastic so lee was sitting right here and i was yeah. with my wife and there's only yeah. there's nobody sitting with us there's like just three of us it was like i called it the right. eric singer table and i'm like uh -huh. i go look at this and i looked at lee and i didn't even know i didn't know who he was and i go i go they're trying to get me sick here they want me out of here and he started laughing and he had a heavy uh -huh. accent so you really had oh, to okay. listen and and then he started talking to me and then uh 
I told him, oh, I go, my friend, I'm friends with Eric. And he goes, oh, and he's talking. And um, we just started talking. And I didn't realize till afterwards he told me that, you know, oh, I was, you know, my name. I go, what's your name? And I'm like, Lee. And he told me his last name afterwards. And, like, and then I knew. But I wasn't going to say, you know, oh, you right, know. Right. And I kept, I try to be cool. But he was the most friendliest guy oh, in the world. He's a lovely bloke, Lee. He really was a good, good lad. Yeah. Really and nice I guy great guy and i got to take yeah. a picture at him eric and i and uh, uh it was just and eric actually when he passed because you got that picture and i go yeah and uh when lee passed away um i sent it to eric and um it, it's just one of those moments it's it was it was rock history i mean he's that guy when you when you were there over the mountain you know the the drum oh, sure, sure, sure. we auditioned so many drummers for that band you did it huh? must have been without exaggeration 40 different drummers you know some, you know, were good players, just not right for the band. Some didn't look right. Some were just didn't fit in personality-wise, whatever. And we went drummer after drummer after drummer. We were auditioning, you know, auditioning and auditioning. Wow. And um, eventually, I think Lee was the last man standing. We had one more guy to see, and that was Lee. And, and if he hadn't worked out, Jet Records wanted us to go into the studio with someone else just to do a session, you know, like maybe Cozy Powell or, or somebody that was around at that time that, that could. But um, And we were saying, mm, we, we want the band complete. We want to do it as a band sort of thing, you know. Yeah. And we'd already chosen the name, the Blizzard of Oz for the band. And we wanted a band situation, you know. And Lee came down to um, uh, film studios in, in South London down near uh, Richmond. And as soon as he started playing, you knew. You know, I think he'd had a tape, a few, a few of our rehearsals of the songs, and and he, and the first one that he played was "I Don't Know." Well, as soon as he started playing, Randy and I looked at each other and thought, "God, where have you been, mate?" Wow. And, and, and that that was it. It was it. He was the drummer, you know, straight he, off. He was the drummer. So you, you just you just felt it. You've got. Oh yeah, a pocket was there. Yeah, everything yeah. was there. I yeah, mean, yeah, really, everything. Yeah. What a swing and what a pocket. He really, you know. Oh yeah, amazing drummer. Also, oh, you're right. He, he's he's from, but uh, man, he's just That's right. Yeah, he had good taste in playing, and um, and and plus Lee was always open to suggestion. You know, he was never sort of um, you know difficult to work with. He was always easy to work with. I'd say try it this way or try that or change your bass drum pattern or do this whatever, and he'd always do it. If it worked, it worked, you know. It's um, but he was uh, great to work with, and and a good lad on the road too. Somebody to hang out with. Was he fun on the road? Yeah, because he seems oh, like nice, the type yeah, of guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He must he have been a, just. He was, he was a he was a tough motherfucker. Too. He was, huh? He was he tough? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you don't mess. I mean, I'm looking at the There's pictures. Some stories like that in my book as well about. We, you know, it was what? like having a having a bodyguard with you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look yeah, at him in the picture. Yeah. Look at him. He looks. Yeah. You don't want well, to. That, that was it. He he had that sort of kind of like a John Bonham thing. Yes. You know, he had that approach to his playing, and he was a burly sort of, you know, hard nut, tough guy, um, with, with you know strength and power, yeah. and and he was sort of like you know, a Bonham kind of character. Yeah, but, um, I mean, I mean, you you could see in this picture the vibe of the band just in the photograph, the the natural laughing over there. You're looking at Ozzy, yeah. look and Lee. So I don't know who told the joke. What what's going on in the picture? But it's it's a great I, shot. No, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we joked a lot and we laughed a lot, and and it was it was good because it, it the atmosphere was always light. Yeah, you know, a lot of the time I'd get serious only about the music. You know. I'd, Say, mm, let's do it again, or let's let's you know have a few more takes to choose from, or whatever. And Ozzy used to sort of jokingly call me Sid Serious because <laughs> I, <laughs> because uh, you know I I used to get uh, well I had that sort of perfection thing. It's got to be right, you know. If it's not yeah. right, then you know forget about it. Yeah, yeah. So this was so this was about seventy nine, right? Was now is this true? Was no, that's nineteen eighty? Not, that was 1980, but when you guys yeah. hired, when you guys all like formed the band, it was around 79, was it? Or it, when when Ozzy and Randy and I got together, it was 79. Oh, it was 79. So and, is and it? Then it, we had a Christmas, a New Year break, uh -huh. and then in the in the New Year of 1980, we carried on putting material together and auditioning drummers 
And then I think it was, it might have been March 1980 that we found Lee. Wow. And, then that, mm. and just went to work on that. So the band originally, yeah. it, was, it was going to be a band, Blizzard of Oz. That was the whole. Yes, that was wow. the name of the band. The name. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, doing yeah. my research, Goodbye to Romance, was that the first song that you guys wrote as a band together? Um, that was one of them. Yeah, that, that cool. and um, You Looking at Me was another one. That was going to go on the album, but ended up being a B-side because we we wanted to have a song to include Lee in because Lee came in when everything had virtually been written. You know? Yeah. But we thought because Lee had, he had good vocal melodies, he had, you know, musical ideas and, um, so we wanted to, to write a song together to include Lee in the writing in at least one song. So we we came up with No Bone Movies, and that went on the album instead of You Looking at Me, Looking at You. Um, but uh, You Looking at Me was one of the first songs that we wrote. That, and I think Goodbye to Romance was um, one of the first as well. Great songs. I mean, great songs. When you were doing the album, when you were making this mm -hmm. music, did you realize how great these tunes were going to be or they're going to be so iconic now? No, not at all. Not at all. Because don't forget, in 1979 and 1980, when this stuff was written and then recorded, you know, the big thing at the time was, was disco, punk, and uh, a new wave, you know. It, so, so we were kind of um, considered as dinosaurs. Not quite, but but it was like, mm, you know, that's old hat shit, you know. Yeah. But, but we just went in. We we weren't trying to have a hit album or even a hit single, or or you know, look at what's in the charts and what's in vogue and what's how should we write. To, we just we just did stuff that that you know we liked and it was from the heart and we just we just played and wrote at, at, you know from from being the people we were and loving the music that we loved and and if people didn't like it well we couldn't help that and if they loved it then fine that's great you know yeah um, yeah i mean excellent, excellent. as we as we began to record and listen back we we did start to think you know, some of this stuff has something special about it. You know, <laughs> and it wasn't just Randy's playing. I mean, Randy was a great guitarist. You know, wonderful guitarist, very special person. But um, it, you know, if you listen to Randy's playing with, say, Quiet Riot and that, he's a great player. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't really happening for the band because the rest of them weren't like the standard of Randy. You know. But when we got together, I think we brought out the best in Randy. And oh, yeah. It, yeah, and it, and it became sort of um, a bit harder, tougher, and heavier. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny. And I think I told you this last time. I always thought Randy was an Englishman. I never thought he was a guy, oh, a kid you? from Burbank. Yes, because he had oh, that okay. Mick Ronson look, you know. Oh, he, yeah, he loved Mick Ronson. He loved the image and the... You know, it even got the uh, the cream Les Paul, yeah. like Mick Ronson played, and, and his hair like Mick Ronson. And Randy was very into that that sort of thing. Yeah, he mm. had that that whole that glam look, but he, he did. Was, but he could he he could shred. He could play. You know, which oh man, he was he was a serious player, Randy. Great, player, yeah, wonderful player. I mean, there's yeah, people. Don't forget, I'd just come from playing with Richie Blackmore. So I wasn't easily impressed, but uh, Randy was impressive. Wow. So think about that now, everybody watching. Richie Blackmore. So before you even knew who Randy Rhodes was, the world didn't know, you're playing with Richie Blackmore. So right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. The world yeah, didn't know anyone. Yeah. There's yeah. another one who's really, really special. Great, you know, wonderful musician. Very, very special. Very... Um, how can I put it? it? You know, it's just they don't they don't come along like that very often. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I mean, I remember at... during the sort of late sixties and seventies, you know, the, the four big ones were Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Richie Blackmore. So when I started playing with Richie, and that that meant a lot to me. You know, wow, you know, it's uh, 
a great band to be in. You know, there, there was Cozy Powell was the drummer and Ronnie Dio was the singer and <laughs> Richie wow. was the guitarist. That, yeah, that was a that was a great um, experience for me. I think mean, a great learning curve. You know. Yeah, legend Ronnie. You know, Ronnie James Dio, which you could find he was in a doo wop band, kind of he was doing before he became. You know. All oh, right. Dio, in the, which, early, in the, early, in the days. early days, and but yeah. it, it, but Bob, it, it was cool stuff that he was doing. Oh and yeah, 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 yeah. Really cool stuff. A lot of people don't. Maybe you don't. People out there watching don't know that. But look at the people that you got to play with. You know, Richie Blackmore, Randy Rhodes, Gary Moore, Tony Iommi. I mean, these are crazy. It's crazy. It's it's just legends of legends. You know. I'm well, I feel you, very honored and very blessed. To have been in those situations, you know, to to play with so many uh, of those greats, you know, from when I was first in London and I joined Chicken Shack, Stan Webb, um, great blues guitarist, wonderful, you know, it's um, the two big ones at that time on the blues scene were Stan Webb and and Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac. Peter Green, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Wild, yeah. Yeah, Luther Grosvenor was another great player. In, in, in a different way, he was—he'd been aerial bender in, in, with Mother Hoople. Yeah, I, I think when when Luther joined Mother Hoople and became aerial bender, he really gave that band a shot in the arm that they needed. You know, Mick Ralphs had left to join or form Bad Company. Yeah, and then Luther went and joined Mother Hoople and changed his name to Aerial Bender. <laughs> But he he was he was great, you know. He was the, the guitarist that that we formed uh, Widowmaker with. It was, it was so just, just think about all this talent, guys hanging out on the scene, but real players. It was such talent out there. Oh yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, I'm gonna Bob. I'm, I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask yeah. you for your top five must-have vinyl records. Like what? <laughs> what? This is what I need to know. It doesn't it doesn't have to be what you played on, but what means something to you personally as as growing up or the, the Bob Daisy you are today. What are the top five you couldn't do without it if you could pick five albums? Oh, wow. Now you put me in a spot. I put you in a spot. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm going to throw a loop here somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You have. You've tripped me up. <laughs> you know, I think well, I'm doing I've got good. Such a vast record collection, you know, both vinyl and and CDs and um, oh, um, the, the ladies well, in the one, chat want to know. I, 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 I and suppose the men. it's it's got to be uh, one of them's got to be a Led Zeppelin album because that you know when I was a lad, I loved Led Zeppelin. And probably I I would say probably Led Zeppelin two, okay, is 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 another you know, uh, Cream, probably, I don't know maybe Disraeli Gears, I love Cream and Jack Bruce was a big influence on, on me. Um, the Jeff Beck group, either Truth or Beck Ola from okay. the early days from like sixty eight or or whenever it was, Truth. Or, or Beckola, probably. I'd, I'd probably lean more towards Beckola, but Ronnie Wood was playing bass, and and he was really, you know, finding his um, sea legs as far as being a bass player. And I loved his playing. Me too. And, and Rod Stewart, you know, that was the first time we'd heard Rod Stewart, you know, on the scene as as being a great rock blues singer, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and probably a Hendrix album as well, because and you know I, I loved all the stuff that was was blues orientated, you know, blues influenced, Cream, Zeppelin, Hendrix, or, um, Jeff Beck, all that stuff it was all blues influenced. So uh, and I, I suppose as a fifth one, it has to be a Beatles album, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it, it yes. Yeah. Uh, now, which Beatles album? That's a tough one. I know, I know. You know, a, a lot of people love Sgt. Pepper, and, and I think it's brilliant. But, you know, um, I don't know, Revolver's a good one too, you know. And, um, you got a good one. Even though that's a double album. You know, maybe the White Album. 
the it's white not album. actually called the white album it was just white in color the, 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 the title of it is just the beatles the, the title of the album is just the beatles embossed on the front and so you're going to you, are you are you going to go with the white album on the fifth? Yeah, go on then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, you know what? I. It's funny you mentioned the white because I would go with the white as well because a lot of people pick Revolver and it's great. They're changing, they're yeah. finding their sounds. They stop yeah. doing live shows, That's but it's right. funny that you mentioned the truth with Jeff, the two Jeff Beck records because it's the oh, same Jim thing. Beckley, yeah. Yeah. What you just said, identical. Yeah. If I loop your conversation with Gene Simmons, I had him do, pick the top five. And Gene, oh, okay. did, uh, he did the same thing what you did. He was like, oh, really? well, truth. Uh, well, maybe it's like, uh, and he, right, he didn't know which right, one to right. pick. And yeah. he picked he picked the, the same segue, what you just said, exact words. Uh -huh. so pretty funny, you know, but there's your top yeah. five. There it is right there, everybody. You got it right here. And you know uh -huh. what? It's, it's the White Album. It really is a great there's great bass playing on there. And when you really listen to it and dissect oh, it. Oh, McCartney as... was brilliant. I mean, he was, uh, you know, all those melodic lines, uh, you know, they were perfect for the songs. You know, they didn't get in the way. Yeah. But they didn't do too much and they didn't do insufficient. They just were just right for the songs, you know. So, so but, John Paul Jones was a great bass player too. Uh, he, an he, amazing, an amazing His influences bass. were like James Jameson and, that's right. People like that, you know. So uh, with with Motown, I mean, when you, so, you hit with the whole Motown stuff, and you go deep about it, and we talk about James Jameson, and I know you probably saw Standing in the Shadows, but like when Marvin Gaye, I did, I did, yeah. What a, what a fantastic documentary for everybody out there watching. If you're into bass playing, it's a must to see this. Yeah, and uh, just James. Oh, Jameson. the one it's called Standing in the Shadows Stand of Motown. Yeah, yeah, but it originally was, I believe, before they made it into a movie, it was a book with CDs that you could hear oh. the bass lines and practice right, to right, it. Right, I actually right. have it. And, right, okay. And then they made it into a documentary later on. Right, but right. Marvin Gaye pulled him out of um, James Jameson out of a bar when he wanted to record what's going on. And That's right. And he was so drunk that he had to lie on the floor doing that, and he still did it. And what you hear on record, that brilliant playing, is James Jameson drunk out of his mind lying on the floor playing? It's in, in, right. Is that incredible? Yeah, it is. It's like how the yeah, hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did he do that? How, can Whoa. you play? Can you play? Ever play drunk? Can you ever in your life? I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that drunk that I have to lie on the floor though. No. But, <laughs> you know, I've, I've done stuff where I'm like well oiled. Oh um, my god. But um, <laughs> I mean, the bass lines on on Jameson's when you listen to. When you really listen to it, it's incredible, you know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. he was he was a real innovator and a real he had he had such style and and I don't think you know for that sort of stuff at least I don't think anybody's touched him. No, never, and he never would change his strings. The 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 the, the yeah, he would say yeah, yeah, yeah. the gunk is the funk. Yeah, that, that what was it? He had a sixty-two precision. Yeah, and then he got, got ripped off and stolen. It was a sad ending. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, oh, he I got, didn't know that. No. I think he got stolen. But then later on, no. he, he, I think he was trying to go, and he, when they had an award ceremony for Motown right before he passed, and he had yeah. to sneak into it. He couldn't even get a pass. And oh, it's such that's a, disgusting. Isn't it? it is disgusting because if, if yeah. there'd be no the car There'd be no Motown if it wasn't the, for him. No, he, he really. He was such a big part of the sound, all those records that he played on. The bass line was was what made Motown. It gave it the backbone. And oh, when you when you listen to it all, like the Temptations, all that stuff. Yeah. And he his yeah, thing yeah, was, yeah. how did he get it? How did he do this? He he pictured a fat woman walking down the street and her ass boom boom. And that's what, oh really? Yeah, Is that, that what he said? yeah. That's funny. yeah. I I get real Bob. You'll you'll wish and stop talking to me because I'll get real geeked out talking about this stuff. But I love I love the history of all this. You know, oh, me too, me too. And, for sure. And and back then you really had to listen to those Motown records to because to capture those bass lines, it wasn't you had to put your head to the speaker to listen to that. You know. Oh sure, sure. It was, it was great stuff. Now everybody goes on YouTube and they they could cheat. Did you ever see people trying to do your bass lines on the internet and? They're doing it wrong, and you yeah, I've seen a few. Yes, some yeah. of them are pretty close. Yeah, yeah, but you want to you, you ever want to write to them? Go look. I'm the real Bob Daisley. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just too polite to do. Well, that, I, you know? I wouldn't put them down, and I wouldn't okay. criticize them. The I might say something like, "This part here 
well, it's not quite right. This is what it is. Yeah. Just so you know. But it, yeah. No, that's yeah. great. You know, yeah, Bob, nice you're, you're a nice guy, and I'm glad you came back. I'm not gonna keep you all night. You know what? It was wonderful chatting with you, and you got to We got to do another chat, you and me and Eric Singer. Well, sure, anytime. Off, I enjoy it. Off the toy, I, I always have fun talking with you. You're, you're. I'm glad Eric hooked us up together. You know? Yeah, me too. It, me it, too. It, it worked out great. But everybody in the chat watching, this is Bob Daisley. He his book is out for fact's sake. It's out on hardcover. So you could get it, go on Amazon. Links will be in the description. And also, check out Bob's new music. I put all the links to the videos. You're going to like it. You're going to love it. And it's good music. It's good feel music. It's something a little different that you're not used to hearing Bob do and uh, all that other stuff. Bob, if David did a movie about you, before I let you go, yeah. what actor could play Bob Daisley? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Oh, Who would it be? Who would you oh, want? Dear. Oh, dear. That's, that, that is a difficult one. Well, I suppose it would depend. It would depend on what age <laughs> at the time in the movie that I, you know, because it's it's been a long career. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, I I I started out <clears throat> quite young, and there's been lots of uh, chapters in that life, and uh, <laughs> I, I suppose we'd have to have several actors for for different um, phases of my career and life. And yeah. age. <laughs> there could be there could be a whole bunch, but uh, I wonder who would, you know what I wonder who would be a, a, a good you know what I think who's the guy that's in Wolf of Wall not Wolf is he in Wolf of Wall Street Yeah 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 because um uh, he would be a, a, I forget the actor's name I'll think of it but he would okay. be a, a, a good one for you if they were going to do it right. I mean right, you right, never right. know what can happen between your book and the crazy Don Arden stories with him with Robert Stigwood it could be a good movie over here you know you're part of rock history well, over here yeah I'd, I'd love to see the book made into a movie it, it, it would be it's really great. great there are a lot of interesting stories you know funny and want... stories and tragedy and and all sorts of stuff you know it's it's um you know, there's, there's, when I was actually writing the book, there were days when I was, you know, I'd look at, I kept a diary, which helped a lot. I took lots of photographs. So in the book, there's like, I think it's 380 photographs, wow. which is a lot. But they're in with the text. You know, there's not a photograph section. Yeah. If you're reading about Gary Moore, Randy Rhodes, or Don Arden, whoever it is, there's photographs on the page that, you know, where you're reading. So you don't have to go searching, which was. You know, which is I thought the best way to do it so you know yeah read it is friendly that way you know it is but, the best way um, to do it. Let, let me ask you bob when you heard the news when randy passed away do you remember where you were at when that when that hit oh yeah yeah i was in houston lee and i were with uriah heap and we'd flown into houston in texas from london um so while we were in the air ironically while we were in the air on a on a plane to Houston, Randy was killed. Wow. Um, what what happened was we checked into the hotel in Houston, and we were going to be playing at a as a big club in Houston called Cardi's. And Lee and I said, "Well, we'll go down and have a look just to see where we we're playing to cool. We we're going to be playing the next night. With the, the the day we flew in, it was a night off. So we said, "Well, we'll go down to Cardi's and just have a look." I think it was it was a sort of like I don't know thousand people sort of situation club you know quite big and we went as we were walking in the, the girl on the door um she said oh um you guys were with ozzy weren't you and blah, blah. she said i think a few of them got killed this morning and i thought oh she said there was a plane crash well i had a thought of of maybe them being on some sort of commercial flight or something you know and the plane crash she said i don't know much about it it just happened this morning she said but if you go in and asked the DJ in the club, he knows about it. So I went in and Lee kept on walking and went and got a drink and he was sat at the bar. And and when I went to the DJ, I asked him and he and he told me it was Rachel, who was the seamstress sort of wardrobe lady, the pilot, and Randy, the three of them were killed in this this small plane. And oh man, it just just blew me away. And I, I went and sat next to Lee and I was speechless. And he turned around and he said, God, what's wrong with you? You've gone all pale. And that's when I told him, I said, Randy got killed this morning. We didn't know the other two. We didn't know Rachel, the wardrobe lady, and we didn't know the the pilot was also the the coach driver. He drove the tour bus. Mm. 
Wow. So, uh, yeah. But um, Lee and I went back to our hotel and we just sat in the bar and drank ourselves silly. Yeah. And cried and cried, you know, because it was just awful. It was awful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? These stories are in the book. You guys could check out the book for fact's sake and much, much more. Look at this. You got all these great stories here. And you know what? Wonderful Bob Daisley. And he's here today. And uh, thank you for being here. Oh, there was a question here uh, from Diane B. Who was you, right here? Let's see. Who was your favorite Beatle vocal singing wise? They wanted to know. Singing wise. Singing wise. Yeah. Um. Well, <laughs> I, don't know, I like them all. I mean, I love John Lennon's voice. Yeah. He didn't yeah. like his own voice, but I, yeah. I love John Lennon's voice, you know. But I thought McCartney had such a great rock and roll voice. I mean, he could do the Little Richard thing and, and you know, he was just wonderful at that, Paul, you know. And, and, and yeah. to play bass like he played and sing was very clever. But, but then you have George with, with that sort of, you know, he had a totally different um, angle and, and feeling and soul in his voice to the others, you know. So, oh, I don't know. I, I, what, it's a I, tough I, one. I, I yeah, it is, yeah. But if I had to choose just one, I'd probably go with Paul. You'd go with Paul. For, See, yeah. for, the, for the rock and roll angle of it, yeah. And it's, but, it's, uh, but, but, but then again, one, one of my all-time favourite Beatles songs is within you without you, which is George. And I loved all the Indian influence of the tabla drums and sitars and you know Indian instruments. Love that. It, I yeah. I love it too. I I would have to go. I love these kind. I like. Thank you, Diane B. Thank you for that question because now you make you made the show a couple minutes longer because I get into a discussion with Bob. <laughs> um, I would Bob. I would definitely go for the Lennon and 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 I love the Lennon because he. Early Lennon, you could definitely hear the Buddy Holly influence, like when even when oh, he did sure. the blood, oh, sure. and, and, the way, and Bob Dylan to a point as well in some of the stuff. What, what you got yeah. got to hide your love away, definitely, right? Yeah, there. yeah, 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 and, yeah. Uh, as you could tell, I'm a big, huge Beatle fan, but something about Lennon's voice because it, you know, none of us can touch him, but it made you feel, oh, I could, I could maybe sing like Lennon. You get that, little, <laughs> you know, but McCartney, you could never take rob him oh, away no, from his little Richard him. vocal no, lines. That's right. Just, that's right. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Did you see? Did you watch the Get Back documentary that they did? Yes, uh, I did. I did. What are your thoughts about that one? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I felt a bit sorry for George because he was uh, out in the cold a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I also thought that he maybe overreacted a little bit by saying, "Okay, fellas, see you. I'm fucking off. I'm leaving the Beatles." And, yeah. Uh, Come here, George. Let me explain. You know. <laughs> Um, I don't know. It was very interesting, but but then again, it, it's such a long time ago. It, 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 and, it's such yeah. it's such a long time ago. But it looked like Lennon, you know, at that period, it, it wasn't so mis like miserable, like the way they made they portrayed it. it like Lennon it looked like he was having a ah, good time. Well, that's that's the thing. The the vibe in the studio was not as bad as what the movie Let It Be yeah. had portrayed, and yeah. you know, it, it's it's. When they got up on the roof, and here's this little rock and roll band, wow! That's all I can say is wow! What what great what a great little rock and roll band they were! Really, were picture being in the street, oh, working oh, one yeah. of the workers just yeah. walking around, going to an office job, yeah, and you yeah. hear, "I've got a feeling." Get back on the yeah. rooftop. It, yeah. it, I actually went. Actually, when I met Lee, the year I met Lee, um, yeah. I was walking around. London and I actually went to the rooftop and it's it's an Abercrombie and Finch uh, Finch whatever you say it's that's a store right, it's a right. clothing yeah. store so I yeah, wanted yeah. to go into the elevator not the elevator the staircase because I guess where uh -huh. the stores are it was their office right. the actual offices where the, the yeah. people would yeah, conduct yeah, their yeah, business yeah. so I opened up the 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 door and I go this yeah. is where they probably had to carry they probably had Mal Evans carry the instruments sure. up there because yeah, he was the yeah, yeah, and yeah. the alarm went off and everybody's looking. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> in trouble. but I had, I wanted so bad to look at this is history. And you know? I, I, I think they did that. It was around sort of January or February or yeah, something. Yeah, I think it was January. Proper yeah. English winter. I mean, that'd be bloody cold up there. How how did they play like that? I don't you know? know. I don't know how oh, they did man. it. It's, it's, it, ring, was, it was raining. It, yep. Ringo had the, the, the red um yeah that, that that red patent leather sort of 
and, and Harrison yeah, had like a yeah. fur jacket on or something. Yeah, like that. that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how did they play? You know, when you think about it, and McCartney only yeah, wore a jacket out in, the, out in the cold before, and I tell, I tell you, it's not ideal conditions. No, not at all. But, but that, uh, was, you know, that was that was a ten out of ten for them for for what they pulled off. It was just brilliant. You th you know, think about their career, the Beatles' career, just in all. It wasn't a long time they were together. And no, every, no, every no, no, album. No, no. What was it? Eight years or something, wasn't it? Yeah, every album was fantastic. Yes, fantastic. There were no fillers. There was no padding. Hmm. It was no. just everyone a winner. Even the worst song, "You Know My Name," look up the number. That that's even good, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they're just, they're okay. just clowning about and having a bit of fun, but it, but it, it still turns out as a classic. It turns. Out, let me ask you. Let's see. Do you know who plays saxophone on that one? On "You Know My Name," look up the number. Is it Brian Jones? You you got it. Now we're friends. You and I, we, <laughs> <brought this. laughs> we got it together. Yeah. Everybody, the wonderful Bob Daisley, and I got Bob. Thank you for being here. This was a fun interview. Oh, it's been man. my pleasure, Stefan. Oh. I I enjoyed it. So we'll we'll do another one anytime. Uh, I lost Bob. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. I lost him. But anyway, that was Bob Daisley. He's wonderful. He's the best. And you know what? These internet people, they threw me off over here. But thank you, Bob, for being on the show. I love you. And uh, he is wonderful. Get his book. Links will be in the description down below. And um, the internet, they hocked me China. But you guys are wonderful. Bob's wonderful. I'm going to write to him right now. And um, until then, everybody, we will see you later. Make sure you subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. Tell me how much you did like the show. And please, please, please check out Bob's music in the links down below. Order his book for fact's sake. It is out there. Um, Debbie Muller, Deb Jackson, thank you for the super chat. You guys are beautiful. Supporting the channel. I love you. I appreciate it. That's for yelling, Ellen. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And um, it means a lot to me. And um, and. You, you guys are wonderful. Um, Mom, I love you too. I know you're watching and uh, you made me, you made me shut off right now because it's time for me to go to sleep. I know my mom's always watching all for me, but you guys are beautiful. Thank you very much for being here. I love you. Mwah! Everybody, we will see you later. Until then, who loves you, baby? We do. And remember, it's only rock and roll and we like it. That was Bob Daisley. He was in the house tonight. Gotta give him a round of applause right here. He's wonderful. You're wonderful. Everybody's wonderful. Wonderful. It's a wonderful time tonight. And uh, check out our other playlist. Will you do me a favor? Share it with everybody. Tell everybody how great this channel is. I'll be making short clips from this interview and putting it out as well. And uh, until then, everybody, I'll see you later. Nighty nighty. I love you. And uh, until then, everybody, we'll see you next week. Bam. <laughs>